Hello and welcome to Politics War Room with James Carville and I'm Al Hunt. This week our guest is Silicon Valley Congressman Ro Khanna. Remember, we love taking your questions, so write into politicswarroom at gmail.com or send a tweet to Politicon for next week's show. Now we're going to get to as many as we can, but don't forget to tell us where you're from. And please check out the link to our sponsors, Real Paper, and our episode show notes. We thank you for supporting the sponsors. It helps make this podcast happen. Please tell your friends about us and remind them to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. James, the noose is getting tighter on Mr. Trump. A couple well-known facts, I think, now. The Trump lawyers met at the Justice Department with Special Prosecutor Jack Smith about the classified documents, uh, we think, uh, that Trump uh, illicitly took and apparently lied about at Mar-a-Lago. Uh, afterwards, Trump sent out a crazed social media diatribe charging that this was the greatest witch hunt of all times. Now, I, to me, that would not suggest that his lawyers called and said, hey, boss, you're in the clear. There's nothing wrong. I think he knows what's going to happen. Uh, and there are more people talking and and more only in Trump world evidence that comes out. They flooded the swimming pool down there, which conveniently flooded the computer server that kept the surveillance tape. I mean, the last time I remember stuff like that was in Nixon when uh, Rosemary Woods uh, somehow erased the 18 and 18 minutes of the Watergate tapes. Uh, I think it's really closing in. And it's uh, I, he's going to face probably an indictment as early as this week, certainly this month. Fulton County is going to follow soon. And as you know, for months, I've been saying that ultimately, I think this is going to affect his support. It's going to sour some of the marginal supporters. Uh, and I think it's going to make him even more unhinged. Well, uh, let, let's start. First of all, it, as I appreciate it, they were too incompetent to flood the actual tapes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I think they stayed intact. <laughs> I mean, uh, th- this is like the gang that couldn't shoot straight, though, was it uh, Jimmy Breslin book. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the, the lawyers requesting a meeting with Jack Smith, that, that's no way to interpret that, but bad news for Trump. I've, I've been some stuff that's, well, it could be a witness and they open this and, you know, that, that we, we don't know. Uh, it could be this, it could be that. There's, there's just no way that that signals anything other than he's in profound legal jeopardy. That, that goes without a, without a doubt. Mm-hmm. Uh, is is to your point? It, it it's going to have to because you have these multi candidates, and it's entirely possible that some of his marginal support will, will dissipate as a result of. You know, and this is not paying a porn star off. This is going to be much more serious shit. But the problem that they all have is if he retains forty percent of the Republican Party, he probably gets a nomination with that. Because they're true. more than not a, a winner take all part. Now, once people start dropping out, I mean, Chris Christie and Mike Pence, then uh, this is my, 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 my bet. Who, who ends up with the most votes uh, at the end of the day, Christie or Pence? Uh, I don't know. Could be, could be a tie. Could be. Could be. But that, that, that's my, that's my, my prop bet. All right. Yeah. <laughs> the answer is not very many. Uh, but, you know, in, in the other problem they have, of course, we'll, we'll talk about it a lot. The Democrats have a multitude of problems. Is it, let, let's assume that he loses the nomination, like maybe like Reagan lost to Ford in 1976. Hank, you know, and Reagan wouldn't do much for Ford, and but he didn't. Trump will, will, will be a third party, a fourth party. He don't care. Yeah. He'll do anything he can. I mean, he don't, he don't no more care about the Republican Party than I do, which. I mean, at least I don't like it. I think he's just ambivalent. It's just something either in his way or he can manipulate for his own good. But, I, I it, you know, I know it's hard, but it's hard to see how Jack Smith doesn't indict him after all of this. But, you know, we'll see. Well, as I said, when those uh, lawyers called Trump, which they did uh, immediately after the meeting, Trump then went and went on a diatribe. So I can't believe they delivered I, anything it, but bad news it, to it, him. It, 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 the, the, the supposition is, but did, yeah. don't forget the Mark Meadows stuff. Don't forget that. 
Right. Who knows what he's saying or not saying? He told um, the truth. That lawyer is not a bullshit lawyer. And let me tell you, I've known people that have done gone through this. I've gone through it a little bit myself. They sit you down and they say the main thing you do not do. They know everything. And they sat in there with, with, with that lawyer and like three associates that, you know, were like top tier, you know, law school grads. And they grilled him from every question. And they said, look, if you got to step out of the grand jury room, you have a total right to him. We'll be right out in the hall. But they know everything. Don't even be tempted to lie. Right. Don't, 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 right. don't even let it cross your fucking mind. And then, of course, that lawyer said, uh, the guy Turwing or something, and I'm told that he's, well, he's a pretty right-wing guy, but he's like a real lawyer. He's got a real yeah. good reputation. I was going to pick up on some of the uh, remarks you made about the candidates. Um, you know, Pence jumped in, Christie jumped in, the governor of North Dakota, who I, I promise if you said uh, that uh, I would be a billionaire for the rest of my life if I could just name the governor of North Dakota. Um, I'm afraid I, think I wouldn't it's make Doug it. Bergman, but I'm not. Well, I, I'm well, not better, you have a better memory than I do because I just maybe. read his name five minutes ago and I forgot it. <laughs> so in All any right. event, he's in. I, I think Pence's political career, like many others, was destroyed by by Donald J. Trump. Uh, let me talk about Chris Christie. Uh, I think Chris Christie. I think it could it could be important. He has no chance, no zero, zero minus of ever winning the nomination, just as he didn't in 2016. Uh, and he has some explaining to do about his Trump association through uh, and actually a little bit after the 2020 election. He actually advised Trump in that October 2020 debate. You know, he got COVID from it. So he's got to explain that. However, having said all that, he is a tough customer. And he is determined, maybe it's guilt, whatever it is, he's going to go after Trump hard. Uh, I don't know if he'll ever get on a debate stage with him. I would think probably not. But no one is going to attack Trump more forcefully or more effectively in that Republican group than Chris Christie. He's going to make some of the others uncomfortable. So, uh, And he also, by the way, I think he's going to go after DeSantis. Uh, I think the fact that Christie is hes smart, he's articulate, he's also, uh, you know, I I think he's got a, as I say, no chance to get the nomination and his service of Trump, you know, isn't going to help him any. But, you know, I, I wouldn't discount him as a force in this, not getting votes, James, but just as a force. Well, let me, a couple of points. I had a speech. It was like one of these things. It was at, actually at Hobart with him uh, October of 2022. And, you know, when you do these things, you spend a lot of time and you wait on doing this event and that event. And he's an engaging guy. He really is. And if you, you had to sit in a green room and bullshit with somebody for 15 minutes, he'd be at the top of the list. Mm -hmm. uh, it's no secret that Donald Trump gave him COVID. He was on a debate prep team and Trump knew he had COVID. And, you, you know, Governor Christie is, you know, he's got to famously have some, some, some weight issues. I don't think I'm talking out of school here. And he was seven days in, in the ICU. I mean, his wife right. came by and little almost had to tell him goodbye. So there's a, a, a burning, searing, you know, to say the least, dislike here. Uh I, and I mean this very, very seriously. You know, he's got kids, and uh, I, I think they're all outstanding, like they went to Princeton or something like that. I I would put a large part, a larger than usual share of my budget on security. I really would. I, I, I'd hire ex-Secret Service agents. I, I would check every room. And I, look, I, I, do I think Trump is capable of ordering a hit on him? Yes, but if he's too incompetent. But they, all of these crazy ass people, and, and let me tell you, there's a lot of them in New Hampshire. Don't don't kid yourself. And you know he's going to be on the attack, and some crazy son of a bitch is going to get the idea that they're going to take him out. And so I I, I, I like uh, yeah. Governor Christie. I think he's a you know happily married man with a with a family. Be freaking careful out there, dude. Be very careful. I think that's These good advice. And, um, you know, his whole, uh, he, look, I, I don't even know why I'm saying this. I'm going to say he, he has everything right in the New Hampshire. He can't win in New Hampshire, but he can do damage to Trump in New Hampshire. And uh, 
I mean, don't forget last time uh, he was the one that really brought down Marco Rubio's campaign. Rubio was an easier target than Trump and they were on a debate stage. But um, I, I, I just think he's a tough customer. He, he is very so, tough. And he, you know, he was a tw- Republican twice elected governor of New Jersey. Uh, and he's very good on his feet. I mean, he's a former, uh, you know, U.S. attorney. And, and he's, yeah. got, he's highly, highly motivated. And, and I, I suspect that he and Governor Snunu, who's a pretty engaging guy, by the way. He, he, he's another guy, if he had to spend 10 minutes with in the green room, you could do a lot worse. Yeah, you sure uh, have a beer with either one of them. Yeah, it wouldn't, uh, but 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 uh, I'm pretty. Sh- I don't know why, but I'm sneaking suspicion that Governor Snoodle is going to endorse Governor Christie, and yeah, you know, the independents can vote. Uh, he can do. You know, he's not going. <laughs> he's just not going to get any fucking votes in that Alabama primary. Of, not going to do anything in Iowa, but he he can he can cause some damage. And he, by the way, he's committed to that. He he's in this. He yeah. he knows he's not going to win this goddamn thing. It's all personal. Yep. And, yep. you know, if you think Liz Cheney is not going to turn over her fundraising apparatus to him, you, you better think again. I mean, it, it, Trump has some pretty profound enemies that can really damage him good. You know, unlike Biden, who, who really, you know, we'll get to talking about this, but he doesn't have a lot of enemies. And, you know, no, no one will go to the ends of the earth to hurt Biden. Trump, that's not the case. Well, my prediction is he's going to drop double digits in the next uh, two or three months. But uh, we will see. So go Chris Christie. Okay, James, now it's time for a riddle. What can be stronger than steel, softer than cotton, and can sequester five times more carbon than pine trees? I'm going to give you the answer. It's bamboo grass. Bamboo is a sustainable superhero, and real paper is using it to make your new favorite toilet paper. It's soft, strong, and 100% tree-free. So if you're still using that conventional toilet paper in your home, there's no better time to dump the stuff that contributes to deforestation and switch to Reel's bamboo toilet paper like we have. When you use Reel, it doesn't feel like you're sacrificing something to help the earth. In fact, it feels like an upgrade. It's always shipped free to your home in plastic-free packaging, and you can schedule it on a subscription so that it comes exactly when you need it. With Reel, you never have to worry about forgetting to buy at any store. And not only is it amazingly high quality, it's a great way to do your part for the environment, James Carville. Yeah, I, I, this is, I, I have a general idea how fast bamboo grows. It's, it's, it's renewable, okay? <laughs> I guess you could say a tree mm-hmm. is renewable because you, you in 40 years, you might get another tree. This stuff is like 40 days. And I just would love to buy stock in this operation because it's going to go from bathroom tissue to a thousand other applications that they're going to be using this for. Because it, 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 at some level, it just makes too much sense. Yeah, it sure right. does. You know, Plus Real is now partnered with One Tree Planet. And with every box of Real that you buy, they are funding reforestation efforts across the country. So unlike the other toilet papers that cut down trees, Real is helping to actively plant them. It doesn't get any better than that. Now, Real Paper is available in easy, hassle-free subscriptions or for one-time purchases on their website. All orders are conveniently delivered to your door with free shipping and 100% recyclable plastic-free packaging. If you head to realpaper.com slash warroom and sign up for a subscription using our code warroom at checkout, you'll automatically get 30% off your first order and free shipping. That's R-E-E-L-P-A-P-E-R dot com slash warroom. Or enter promo code warroom to get 30% off your first order plus free shipping. Let's make a change for good this year and switch to real paper. Real is paper for the planet. You also can find the link in our show notes. James, our guest, uh, one of our favorite guests, I think this is his third appearance on the show, is uh, one of the really influential progressives in the House of Representatives. 
the congressman from the Silicon Valley, Ro Khanna. Ro, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. I always love being on. I, I said, what did I do wrong? Usually when I get invited on, I made some mistake, but I appreciate uh, having the chance. I, I doubt that. But anyway, we're going to test you this time. You have called on 89-year-old Diane Feinstein to resign, given her condition, absences, and age. Now, I want to ask you about President Biden's age, and I want to stipulate that it is a, a, a different situation that he seems perfectly able today to do his job. And the Republican rhetoric to the contrary is, if you'll pardon the expression, bullshit. But he has had successes. But he also shows signs of aging. And if he's successful, uh, he will be 86 at the end of another term. Does that give you some concern? Age is going to be an issue. I believe that the president uh, will be able to overcome it because he will talk about a successful two years that he's had. He will show people that he's still empathetic, that he's still engaged. The times I met with him, he's got his uh, classic sense of humor. Uh, He connects with people. Uh, But of course, look, the country doesn't want two 80-year-olds, ideally, to be president. uh, But you you don't get to pick the ideal situation. And the reality is he's the best Democrat to be able to deliver uh, for what we want. And he's still the best Democrat to beat Donald Trump. So do I wish he was 10 years younger? Sure. Uh, but uh, do I think he's the best Democrat to win? I do. Boy, I don't know how you get there. Maybe you're right, but uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., and I say this is a great admirer of the Kennedys. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is a flake with some really dangerous views, and he keeps climbing in the polls. He's up to 20% now. Uh, I don't think that's an RFK vote. I think that's a vote about people who say Biden is just, he, he's been a terrific first-term president. But now it's time to bow out. And don't you think, There's a possibility, at least, that some more credible Democrat might enter this summer who might even have a better chance against a Trump. I don't think it'll happen, but I'll I'll tell you one of the things I think President Biden needs to do. And I was up at the Shaheen dinner in New Hampshire. He needs to campaign up in New Hampshire. And this idea of skipping a state that has been first for decades is a mistake. And he's giving oxygen to people like Robert Kennedy and Marion Williamson to go talk to uh, New Hampshire voters. It, the president would do very, very well up there. So I think we've got he's got to be out there. He's got to be active. He's got we've all, he's got to be making the case uh, to the American public. But it comes down to who's going to win Pennsylvania, who's going to win with Michigan, who's going to win Wisconsin. And I think uh, just yesterday there was an article about how manufacturing is coming back. Paul Krugman wrote about it. Manufacturing capacity investment is back. He's got to take that uh, message out there to people and make the case that he can deliver. Let me let me come come back sort of to the Feinstein issue. If she does resign, and others have joined you now in calling for her to resign after an incredibly distinguished Senate career, Governor Newsom has vowed to appoint a black woman uh, to replace her. Uh, Congresswoman Barbara Lee, who you've endorsed, is running for the Senate. Should he, if that happens, should he appoint Congresswoman Lee and really kind of interfere in a primary? Or would he be better off picking uh, one of the many other qualified black women in the state of California for a short term, year and a half tenure, and then let uh, the primary between Congresswoman Lee and the other two members of Congress play out? I'll say two things. First, we've been tilting the playing field against black women in this country for 250 years. It's not the end of the world if we tilted the playing field for a black woman uh, today. I mean, it's, it's, it, it, people are making this out to be some uh, grave problem if that happens when uh, we haven't had a single African-American, we don't have a single African-American woman in the Senate. But if he feels that strongly about it, he can appoint a caretaker. Since Harris left, yeah. Would, would that be your recommendation? He appoint a caretaker? I, I think I have no problem. I think he should just appoint Barbara Lee. She's, she's qualified. She's she's uh, she would she would be uh, uh, a, a, a thoughtful candidate. But I've also said because I, look, I'm biased. I'm the chair of Barbara Lee's campaign. That I have no problem if he appoints a caretaker. And there are plenty of African American women he who he could appoint. But this idea that oh we've got to now be strictly neutral when for 250 years we we had barrier after barrier uh, for African American women participation. I I just don't have much sympathy for that. James. So Congressman, uh, be, be a little bit blunt. I was had a conversation with a, a 
Fulcrum's out friend of mine who's, who's actually quite good and quite wise. And we concluded that if someone, an ambitious person in the party said, you know, we want to be president one day, I, I think I want to have my best chance in 2028, I would say, no, your best chance is 2024. 2028, it, there's going to be an enormous amount of talent running for president. I mean, I can start with Wes Moore, we can go go to Josh Shapiro, Raphael Warnock, Gretchen Whitmer. I mean, I don't want to give up because if I give it a list, I'll, I'll, I'll forget through Ro Connor. Ro Connor, okay, a, another person. And, I, you know, right now, Bobby Kennedy's sitting at 20%. And uh, admittedly, people say, well, he's a flake. Okay, he's a flake. The, the, the flake is at 20%. And you, you're correct to point out you're up there in New Hampshire, but uh, Senator Shane, they're mad. They, this this play to take the first primary away from them, that, that's like their Super Bowl, man. They're caterers and chauffeurs and hotels and restaurants and stuff like that. They're not happy about this. And, you know, I'm, I'm just giving you the free advice of, or anybody about running for president, but, but from your perception of New Hampshire, what do you – what do you you think the president should go there and compete, I gather? Tell us where you are on that question. Absolutely, he should go there. I think he's got to file, uh, and he's got to just at least make one speech, one appearance there. He's done a lot in moving South Carolina up, and that's great. And if we went over a couple cycles to move South Carolina up and have New Hampshire second or third, I mean, that's not the end of the world. But right now, if he doesn't compete, he's giving one year to DeSantis, Trump, and all of the uh, other Republican candidates to go speak to independent voters and everyone's going to be filing stories out in New Hampshire saying uh, people are souring on President Biden. He's got to go there and he's got to compete. And I think he would win if he does that. Uh, in, and uh, there's no reason for him not to at this point. So th that's the first point. The second point is, look, I, I think if you want to be president of the United States, you've got to have the right vision and you're going to be able to beat the uh, talented people. I mean, Bill Clinton in 92 didn't think, well, there's Mario Cuomo and there's Bill Bradley and there are all these other people. He said, I think I'm the best person to, to, to lead the nation. And, and Barack Obama didn't think 2008, there's Hillary Clinton. He said, I'm the best person to lead the nation. I don't think you game out winning for president. I think you run when you think you have the uh, ability to lead the nation and your message resonates. And I guess my, right now, my view is I'm not sure that uh, the Democrats are looking for the new thing. I think we're so spooked by Donald Trump, we just want to make sure someone can win. And that's why people aren't entering, because they Biden beat him before, and they think uh, most people think he'd, he'd have a good chance to beat him again. So you don't detect any generational impatience out there? I do. Like this is kind of a, a time that, it, it, I mean, Biden's approval among blacks is 60, which is not very good at all. I don't need to tell you that. You're a much better mathematician than me. According to the Harvard poll, which is actually pretty good, his approval under 30 is 32. I, I mean, th these are not numbers that we want to go to post with. We're not going to win unless we have a robust black turnout and a robust under 30 turnout. And, and maybe we need to, the thing to do is we all get behind the wheel and, and try to push this. But but right now, we're, we're, we're weak in the two most, and I think two two of the most important constituents in the entire Democratic Party. I share your concern. And I think we've got to be out there talking about uh, economic issues with the, the African-American community in particular. I mean, wh what are we doing to help people build economic wealth? What are we going to do on student loans, which are a huge issue, uh, particularly for African-American students? What are we doing in terms of job creation? What are we doing to deliver uh, on police reform? Uh, but my sense is that we've all got to do uh, our part to, 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 to mobilize and win. I just think as a practical matter, I don't see uh, someone else jumping in against the uh, president with Donald Trump on the other side. And I don't I don't see Donald Trump losing on the other side. I think we're going to have uh, this heavyweight uh, two people, Biden, Trump again. And but then I think in 2028, there's going to be a whole new generation and people are going to say we're sick of this. And, and the country is ready to, to turn the page with with the new. So, so, Congressman, before I turn it over to Al, I, I, the, 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 when everything I see, and I've been looking at a lot of polling lately, 
it, cost of living is what, the, what people say. And I just would urge people, when you stand up in the caucus, say, let's not use the word inflation near as much as we talk about cost of living. And by the way, I saw uh, Congresswoman Barbara Lee the uh, day before yesterday in Washington. We happened to be, I was eating lunch at the old Trump Hotel, and she came up and was quite gracious. And I said, Congressman, if I were you, I, I would I would talk about cost of living, but I, I want to get to this point. So I was reading this this guy, Zach Carter, who did a, we had him on our podcast, did a, a magnificent okay. biography on John Maynard Keynes. And he was talking about this heterodox economist uh, that has some, some rather interesting views on inflation. I really recommend that you have your staff pull that up for you and, and, and take a look at it because because the cost of living issue, I promise you, is not going anywhere anytime soon. And we can say there's a headline inflation number that, you know, it was 6.5%. Now it's 3.9%. We're making progress. But the voters don't feel that way. But anyway, that was just me speaking extemporaneously. I agree with you. A few things that I'm passionate about. James, I agree with you completely. I mean, look, uh, you get had wages relatively stagnate. Uh, we couldn't get the minimum wage increase. We haven't been able to increase wages in the way we should. And then at the same time, you got the price of eggs that are higher. You've got price of bacon that's higher. You still have gas that's that's too high. Uh, we've got to be bolder. Look, Rishi Sunak, a conservative guy in Britain, is out there saying we're going to have caps and not have uh, people pay too much money for food. And I, I think we've just got to be bolder on uh, talking about uh, policies that can make sure that price of food isn't too much. we got to make sure that we're uh, dealing with the cost of housing, uh, the cost of student loans, cost of child care. Uh, and uh, I, I agree with you. It's those pocketbook issues that are uh, that that are determinative. Right. As I told Congressman Lee, things pile up on you. That's that's the way that, you know, when you're talking to people, they things pile up on you because that's, that, that's, that's what people feel like out there when they do things. But, but you know, and I love your opinion on this. Because I, I read Paul Krugman's op-ed, manufacturing's coming back and capacity of manufacturers going up. And, and I think the president's policy has been by and large right. But here's one thing, and I don't agree with everything that Bill Clinton did. But when people woke up uh, every day, people thought Bill Clinton is there to help my life economically. That he wakes up in the morning, afternoon, evening, and what he's thinking about is the economy and helping people. And like I said, I don't agree with all his policies, but I don't think we have that same focus right now as a party. The president needs to be out there on diners and small towns and factory towns. He's going to be talking about the economy in the morning, economy in the afternoon, economy at night. And he's got to get people to think that the one single thing he's going to do in 90 percent of his day is make people's economic lives better. Congressman, let me let me just go backwards for a minute uh, and then we'll come forward again. But uh, the debt default bill. Uh, you were one of the most respected progressives in the House. Uh, you voted against that compromise. And I guess what confuses me about it, and I think what the Republicans did in the debt ceiling was as reckless as you could possibly be. But the final deal ended up a lot better than many people thought it would be. And I give the Biden team and some Republicans credit for that. And, and I guess I looked at your vote as kind of you know, one of those where you let the unattainable perfect be the enemy of a pretty good compromise because the alternative was default. Well, I give the president credit. I agree with you that the deal could have been much worse. And I would have probably voted for it if it was under regular negotiation of a budget. But that's not what this was. This was the Republicans taking hostage the country saying, if you don't negotiate on our terms, we're going to default. And I believe the president could have just have Treasury keep paying the bills. Uh, Jerome Powell is not going to not clear the Treasury Department's checks. And the Treasury Department could have still issued uh, bonds. And so I think the president had other options that economists and Larry Tribe have said uh, that would not have risked the kind of default and would have shown, in my view, would have been held constitutional. And I'm sick of Republicans every few years holding the country hostage with the debt ceiling games when Democrats responsibly vote to raise the debt ceiling when we have a Republican president. And that's why I voted no. I, I, it, it wasn't, I didn't love the compromise, but it, it, it wasn't that I didn't think that the compromise that the president did the best he could. 
it was more in the process of it. Well, I certainly agree that you ought to get rid of the debt ceiling. Uh, that's for sure. Another issue, um, it's not looking backwards. It's really looking forward is Ukraine. You were one of the signees of that letter seven months ago calling on the administration to start negotiating with the Russians. The letter was then with, with withdrawn. As you look at it seven months later and you look at the situation today, how do you assess Ukraine and how do you assess the Biden administration's performance? The Biden administration has done as well as they can. Uh, let me be clear, if they come to Congress for supplemental funding for Ukraine, I would vote for it. Uh, I still believe that uh, they need to keep the lines of communication open with the Russians, which they have, which Blinken has, which Jake Sullivan has. Uh, but uh, with the counteroffensive going on right now with Ukraine, I mean, we've got to give Ukraine uh, the, the tools and military they need to see this through. And then hopefully if they uh, succeed, that gives us the chance for a, for a just peace. But I, I actually think that the Biden administration has handled this uh, very responsibly overall. They have not uh, inched us towards a world war, and yet they've stood steadfast with Ukraine and helped to build a, an alliance. And I expect there's still 300 votes in the House for uh, funding for Ukraine. That's welcome news. One more. You are a senior Democrat on the House Oversight Committee. You're one of the senior Democrats on that. Republican Chairman James Comer uh, talks about an alleged criminal scheme involving President Biden and foreign money. Uh, I mean, he has impugned the integrity of the FBI. Are these serious investigations or is Chairman Comer playing political? games. You're playing politics. I mean, give me a break. You run for president of the United States. Everything about what you've done since kindergarten comes out. You think if there was something like that, people wouldn't know and the random chair of the oversight committee would be discovering that? I mean, that's just not how the process works. I mean, uh, the, the reality is right. this was a document that that uh, was based on secondhand information and that the FBI themselves investigated and said that there was nothing to the investigation. And the reason that they don't want to make that document public is they don't want to compromise the source. It has nothing to do with trying to protect President Biden. Uh, I wish that the Oversight Committee would spend more time worried about price gouging, worrying about uh, what's happening to ordinary Americans' pocketbooks than they are about playing these political games. So, Congressman, uh you're one of our favorite guests, and we obviously don't cut you any slack, although you're a good friend of ours. But in return for your, your being so articulate and, and so available to us, I'm going to give you some advice to pass on to the Democrats. And much of this comes by way of Al Hunt, who points out that both the Trump individual tax cuts are going to be up for renewal in 2025, and the Obamacare subsidies are going to be up for renewal in 2025. These are golden opportunities. When you go around the country and campaign with these people, make them say, where are they going to be on this? Are, are, are you going to get rid of subsidies to preserve tax cuts for people making over $100,000 a year? All right. This, this make is a lot more than that, James. Yeah. What, what, yeah, a lot more than that. But, but you understand, this is something simple and real and relevant that we can frame going forward. And we have to frame it because it's really on. It, that's a no brainer to a guy like you. But that's a hard question for them to answer. I agree. That's great advice. And I didn't think of it in that simple a way. And sometimes I think yeah. uh, we don't do enough to frame things simply and to get the Republicans uh, to, 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 on the record. And that's a really good point. Right. I mean, are you going to be for right. uh, extending the Trump tax cuts to the very wealthy? Uh, or and cutting health care from the working class, or are you going to vote to to repeal the Trump, Trump tax cuts to people making right. over 400 grand and be for health care for the working and middle class? And one mistake we made in retrospect in, with, with the Build Back Better is I wish we had separated some of it and put the Republicans on notice. Are you for increasing the minimum wage? If I wanted 15 bucks, even 12 bucks, 10 bucks, are you, and make them vote on these things and get them on the right. record is the party that's not for the working and middle class, and our party is. You know, I mean, look, I disagree with Joe Manchin, a bunch of issues, but there's 80, 90 percent where we agree on increasing minimum wage and taxing people who are wealthy, and we need to highlight mm. that difference and put the Republicans on record. 
Absolutely. And you know, with the cost of living being what it is, the last thing we can do is not support families who need subsidies to get their health care. Um, I mean, when they, you're asked about cost of living, say, this is one thing that we can do that they can take away from, you know, and have, you know, it's easy to find out how many people are affected by these subsidies, but I suspect it, it, it's a lot. But it's, it, it's just an easy one to, to tee up. This is playing tee ball. You don't have to nothing. You just put it right on the tee and hit it. <laughs> okay. I'll raise that in caucus with the team. I agree with you. These are two good issues for us to be running on in 24, regardless of where we're running in the country. Let me just add to that, Congressman. Not only are the tax cuts up, which are pegged at about $3 trillion over a decade, the Republicans wanted to cut spending for basically poor people by $3 trillion that they couldn't get. In this, I mean, it's amazing the, the 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 symmetry there between the three trillion dollar Trump tax cuts and the three trillion dollars of social spending the Republicans want to come back after, in addition to Obama subsidy. And I think James is absolutely right. That ought to be framed in every single congressional district this year. Or you're, you're both right. I mean, look, they're they're cutting housing assistance, they're cutting child care assistance, they're cutting health care assistance at a time where people are struggling to make the bills. And why are they cutting it? Because they want to give tax breaks to wealthy people. And, uh, you know, we, we, we sometimes don't say the, 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 the obvious uh, enough. Ro Khanna, you are one of our favorite guests. Uh, you, are, you are terrific, and I uh, hope we can get you back on again. Uh, and the best of luck in the months ahead. I always enjoy it, and I enjoy what you guys are doing, and keep... Uh, Keep telling us how to frame these issues simply and, 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 and the pocketbook <laughs> issues. I mean, I, the last thing I want to say is, look, we had two successful Democratic presidents, in the, in, just electorally. Bill Clinton won two terms, Obama won two terms. Clinton showed that it was about the economy. Obama showed it was about aspiration and having a positive vision of America. And my view is, look, you can have differences, but just take the, the two things that worked and uh, build on that. And... Uh, I don't know for the life of me why we, we don't do that as a party. Well, uh, if they listen to you, they'll do a better job. Thank you, man. All right, now, James, for our segment on Screw the Voter. Of all the achievements of the 1960, the great civil rights bills protecting housing and public accommodations, Medicare, Maybe at the top of the list is the 1965 Voting Rights Act. As the Brennan Center's Michael Waldman noted, it really guaranteed the right to vote, fulfilling the vacant promise of the 15th Amendment that guaranteed the franchise to black Americans. But ever since it was enacted, conservatives have been trying to chip away at it. And no one has led that, that I think, nefarious effort more than now Chief Justice John Roberts. Section two of the Voting Rights Act has, you know, which, which allows suits against racially discriminatory measures, and Lord knows there have been, and just enables you to sue. There's now a case before the court, gerrymandering case in Alabama, that threatens to gut, and gut that section two if, as expected, the conservative majority led by John Roberts goes along with the state of Alabama which came up with the congressional redistrict, and they have seven members in the state, in the uh, rather seven congressional districts in Alabama. The state's about 27, 28% black. And what they did is they put as many, packed as many blacks in one district as they could. And so black Americans will have one representative out of those seven, and the other six are guaranteed to be non-black. Now, if that's not racial gerrymandering, I don't know what is. But I think the odds court watchers tell us is that John Roberts and his Republican colleagues, the Republican Chief Justice John Roberts and his Republican colleagues this month are going to uphold that uh, that gerrymandering. Uh, and they may achieve their political objective, but they further undermine what was considered in 1965 a precious right given to all Americans for the franchise. So in... The 92 War Room, a lot of people have gone on to have remarkable success in different ways. I, I don't know if Michael Waldman wouldn't be at the sort of top of that list. I mean, for what he, he's done there at the Brennan Center, I mean, it, it, everything he puts out is pure gold. 
uh, it's, they really, really do good work. Uh, I, I'm, you know, we need this country needs about uh, you know a hundred thousand more Michael Waltmans, and we'd be in pretty good shape. And, and, and I don't think Michael Waltman would take money from the Saudis. I really don't. No, no, no. I don't either. But uh, anyway, I think that ruling is going to be a disaster, and just you know, further. Of course, it, of course it is. Of course it is. Of course it is. A, a judicial modesty. Yeah. Just overturn yeah. acts of Congress like that. They're not even there. James, you have they, to understand oh, they, they, what those conservative Republicans believe is you don't legislate from the bench, right? Oh, right. sure you don't, right? No. no. Yeah. Anyway, it's, it's oh, going to be a miserable last three weeks I, watching. By the way, I, it, would you be surprised if the Saudis are not supporting Clarence Thomas in some way? I, w- I wouldn't be at all. I mean, I'm mm-hmm. not saying that they have, but. Yeah. You know, it's, it's unbelievable. Well, it it, it is. Somebody, somebody doesn't come up and, you know, run against the scam we are. Mary, I got you a latte. It's in the refrigerator. James, now for the outrage. The Professional Golf Association sold its soul and its integrity this week with what really is a takeover by Saudi Arabia. You know, these they had been competing with an LIV tour and a number of golfers signed up at a huge bonus and a number of others stayed away on principle. The new chairman of the Golf Association is the head of the Saudi Sovereign Wealth Fund and a close confidant of their infamous uh, dictator, MBS. Uh, it was only a few months ago, I think, that the head of the PGA, a guy named Jay Monahan, vowed he'd never, never allow any kind of alliance with Saudi golf effort. They're trying to buy uh, influence over here. He, he noted that he had friends who had family who died at 9-11, and the Saudis had covered, who were in, had covered up Saudi involvement in 9-11. And he promised the 9-11 families he would never do business with them. Uh, they also criticized the murder and dismemberment of Washington Post columnists and critic of this present Saudi regime, Jamal Khashoggi, uh, which the CIA said was ordered by Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. But the cowardly Monahan cut this deal in secret. It was all about one thing, obviously, money with the Saudis. Uh, and uh, to make sure he was taken care of and really just uh, cutting off the, the limbs for a lot of golfers who refused to go along with the money deal with the Saudis, including Tiger Woods. But, and the guy who was ecstatic about it, in addition to MBS, was Donald Trump because now they're going to play tournaments at his golf courses. And this is just, it's understandable, it's money, and it's really sleazy. Well... I mean, this is so so revelatory. It's so illuminating. It so says who we are and what we are in 2023. A, a very close friend of mine, a, a former CIA agent by the name of Mike Hurley, was very involved, was very senior in the 9-11 report. And it, it was a kind of liaison. It was very close to the, the families of, of the people who were killed in the World Trade Center, and they were very active. Of course, they, they had to get everything in the world to move Congress to, to survivors could get help from all the diseases that they suffered. And, and of course, the, the right exploited this to their political advantage like you wouldn't believe. You're not old enough to remember uh, what it was like in late 2001 and 2022 when Ari Fleischer the press secretary of the president of the United States said people need to be careful what they say. And, of course, we were regaled about being weak on terrorism and all that shit. And then they dismember this Washington Post columnist and everybody swears on the altar of God, eternal hostility toward the murderous, corrupt Saudi regime. And you know what the Saudis did? They laughed. They laughed. They just laugh. <laughs> You're kidding me. You, you, these people are a sack of potatoes. You, 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 you know, as John Bro said, it's, sometimes it's cheaper to rent than it is to buy a legislature. And this is where we are. 
it, it, it's just a, a perfect example uh, and it is what, what mortifies me about Ukraine is we just quit. Uh, or, you know, enough money, cheap, you know, the promise of cheaper gas, anything you want, it's everything is a freaking scam. Everything is a scam. Everything is a hustle. There's a, a I, I just could go on and on, but I, 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 I don't want to sound like a bit old man, but it, th- this is so indicative of where we are. Oh, you're absolutely right. And my only hope is that the 9-11 families with a lot of other supporters will bring pressure on some people, uh, yeah. some advertisers. I, yeah, they, they can bring pressure and the Saudis bring money. Yeah, What do you think is right. going to rule the day? Yeah. And, yeah. And, yeah, look, man, we, you know, You're right. and, and by the way, they, they, were, they were attacking them on Fox and people are tired of these people. You know, they're just, they're just whining all the time. Imagine, you know, having your dad is a 32-year-old fireman running up a stairwell and getting crushed to death. And I, I mean, it just, it, it, I, I'm so bitter and down. I, it just, because it, it, it just, it's, this is just one whorehouse sports deal, but it speaks volumes to, to us as a people. Yeah, because there are going to be others. Uh, yeah, of course is, there are. The Saudis have found this is a good way to, you know, to buy, um, you know, phony credibility. But, but anyway, they get, okay. They get, and I mean, the other thing you're going to hear is these golf dickweeds about the sacredness of the game and the traditions and the green jacket and Mr. Cliff and, and you know, Bobby Jones and the pastoral sport, you know, the gentleman, you know, no, no cheating on a code bullshit. Bullshit. At, at, at least, like, the major sports just, you know, they, they sign for the most money. You know, if you're a baseball player, football player, basketball player, you you know, you, you don't go and art, articulate the sanctity, the inner sanctum of, you know, Augusta. Shit, the Saudis might buy Augusta. They'd, believe me, they'd sell it for enough money. Oh, they would in a minute. In a in minute. A minute. They, and they would decorate that green jacket with the Saudi flag. Yeah, I mean, yeah, know, get, yeah. get a pimento cheese sandwich. It just it, <laughs> it, it exposes you. Just don't even know is there anything left that's not a hustle. I don't know. I, I, I'm in a and then of course you had the the whole. Woke DEI was a giant. You had to hire these people. Now we're at a thing in the New York way. This Barry Weiss, is, who's the, you know the anti woke crusader in Austin, is raising millions of dollars. Everything is just hustle this, hustle that. They just the problem they have, James, is they can't tell us what it is. It's not, actually, is that a problem? Because they don't care. Uh, but when when Nikki Haley was asked in debate the other day, just tell us what woke anti woke is. Uh, she couldn't. She just said, basically, I'm against it. And then she went on to say that the greatest issue facing women in America today is trans, trans trying to participate in women's sports. There probably are about four score all over America, but that's more important than pay equity. That's more important than abortion rights. That's more important than anything, Nikki Haley says. OK. Well. I, uh, was some, uh, you know, everybody prepared to faint. Trump was right. He said, well, let's go talk about woke. I, I made a big splash and got a lot of publicity. I think, I, you know, when I said the woke stuff is killing us back in 2021, I, I was 100% correct. But I don't even like the term anymore. Mm-hmm. It, it's, it's just come to, to have not, no meaning is that everybody slings it around. It, 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 you know, the best step, there was a piece in the Atlantic about a guy, Thomas Chatterton Williams. I didn't know, he's a guy from New Jersey, went, covered wokeism in France. And he described it as the, the triumph of identity over ideology. And that's the best definition I ever heard in my life. That, yeah. that I want to be looked at more for my identity than I do my ideology. And that's, I, I, I think that's a bad way to go through life. Yeah. 
I agree. But I, I, I think uh, I don't like the term anymore. I think it's a, it's open, it's dumb. It tended to, since it had meaning. Uh, in our, I would remind our listeners that the first recorded use of the word woke was about a great lead belly lead better who was a terrific music, black musician in the 1920s who was born in Caddo Parish, I think Shreveport, died in a Houston jail, and said that black people should be woke with their interactions with the police, which seemed like sound advice in 1920s, you know, Houston, Shreveport. Yeah. Uh, you know, probably pretty sound, but, you know, as everything, overeducated white faculty members got a hold of the word and ruined it for everybody. But yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm anti the woke word. Yeah, me too. All right, now, James, for our listener questions, which always are great. Sometimes our answers are okay. Uh, We've got a real range today. We'll start with Brandon in Eugene, Oregon. And he said he read that the Biden team is looking at competing in Florida for 2024, even though it's more red uh, than ever. With the recent win in the Jacksonville mayorality race, is this a possibility for him to compete there? And tell me which, where you think he would have a better chance, North Carolina or Florida? Well, let me start first, North Carolina. All right. That, that's a definite, that's a definite go. I, I would put Florida on the watch list. All mm-hmm. right. I mean, it, 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 it's not Iowa, but, 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 but North Carolina is easy. It, that was an encouraging win. Let, let me give you a couple of names and Nikki Freed is a good friend of ours, is the new chair of the party. And she started out with a win. A good, in fact, a, a good win. Uh, there's a Broward County, I think Fort Lauderdale, a uh, school board member who's quite good named Jennifer Jenkins. A- and uh, she, she might be be taken on. Remember, Rick Scott is pretty damn vulnerable. He's out front on cutting Social Security and Medicare and raising taxes mm-hmm. on, on, on on working people. And be careful that, that there. Yeah. And also, the, and I'm embarrassed to say this, I think Fentrice is her first name. They, they tell me that the, the Democratic House leader in the Florida State House is is a woman of enormous talent and, and enormous charisma. And I, I, I profoundly apologize, but she she's a, a a black lady. But she is a really by everything that I hear is you know a, a top one and a half or one percent talent wise and. You know, I, 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 I would put it on the watch list. I, I, I wouldn't say no. I wouldn't say yes. Uh, but put, it, put it on the go watch. in North Carolina. Yeah, and, I did it all and, and don't and maybe, uh, maybe in Florida if you're a Democrat in 2024, right? Maybe, yeah. But, but North okay. Carolina, just, just plow. Plow. Next is Susan is in Washington, D.C. via Krakow. I don't know whether she's oh, wow. in Washington or Krakow now. But she wants to know why we let Republicans get away with the redefinition of women's rights uh, as abortion, but adopt the definition ourselves. Can't we promote women's rights, which includes equal pay for equal work and sovereignty over their own bodies, including abortion? Women's issues should be a winning issue, Susan says, for Democrats. Susan, amen. You're absolutely right. Now, the only danger you sometimes get into is, and I agree with James, I don't like to use the woke term anymore, but there's one group that talks about instead of, you know, a woman's right to abortion, it's, it's a, the, I forget the term they use, but basically it's a birthing person, the right of a birthing person. Uh, that's just nonsense. I mean, stop that. Talk about basically restoring Roe v. Wade rights. But Susan, you're absolutely right. The equal pay issue is still there. And there are a number of women's issues that I think Democrats are in a much stronger position than Republicans. But but I've been kind of gloomy for for most of the show. Let me interject a little good news in here. Don't look now, but we win in elections everywhere. (laughs) Okay, we just win. And and if you tempt people and they'd say, what's the chief reason? (laughs) I can tell you what the chief reason is. Jobs. All right. Every time you turn around, Pennsylvania, Florida, Colorado Springs, Wisconsin, 
I mean, it, 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 I mean, when Kansas, you win elections left and right. And you, don't kid yourself. There, 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 there's some pay, and but with any kind of skill, there'll be more more to pay coming up hopefully in 2024. But right now, it's going pretty good for us. Yeah, it sure is. Um, Charles in Christchurch, New Zealand. I oh, love to man, hear from I those go people so down under. Uh, he, he asked a question, and, and James, you covered it in our chit-chat, but let's go over it again. Charles says there's a hypothetical. Could the Republicans get to the point where Trump becomes so toxic they dump him for DeSantis, and in his rage, Trump runs as an independent that splits the Republican vote, and Biden romps home in 2024. Well, uh, yes. I mean, I don't know if they could, I think they rage as much as he does, you, you, you know. But but he's going to do whatever he thinks can keep his fat ass out of jail. I, but the other thing that I wouldn't discount, in, in this is a little offbeat, but if you're a judge and, and he's being arraigned, do you deem him a flight risk? Because let me tell you, that guy's going to go to Abu Dhabi and and live on the top floor of the you know four seasons of Ritz Carlton or whatever. I I don't know, but he ain't gonna stick around <laughs> and and go to. He's gonna have to wear an ankle bracelet, that. James. He might. I, I, I they might have to do that. And, you yeah. know, and have to yeah. surrender his passport because he 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 might he might announce that he's going to LIB and inspect some golf courses and and. Abu Dhabi and just not come back. That's a real possibility. Don't don't get that. I'm, that's not something we're just making up in the locker room here. That's really something to think about. Because that guy it is, he, uh, he, you know, he's he, he ain't gonna go visit Elizabeth Holmes. I can tell you that. He gonna get he, <laughs> he he's gonna be like a hockey player and get the puck out of here. Just just keep your eye on it. We're going to continue our streak of uh, of global questions. We started with Crack Al, and then oh, we went Christ to New Zealand. Somebody can get me a lunch with Peter Jackson in Wellington. I'd fly on my own dime just to worship at his Let's feet. work on it. Get James yeah. lunch. Yeah, we're with Peter Jackson. Phil in Munich, Germany. Phil asked, why is there so little respect for age and experience in America? In the 20th century, there are many examples of great statesmen, Churchill, De Gaulle, Adenauer, who held high office at an advanced age. Phil, I got to tell you, if the election comes down in 2024 to Joe Biden versus Donald Trump or Ron DeSantis, it, it, I've never had an easier vote. I mean, it's so simple. Of course, you vote for Biden. And I am among those that worry about his age. And he's going to be 82. He'll be 86 at the end of any uh, uh, second term. And your examples, I think, are instructive. De Gaulle actually left office at age 79. He left office uh, not very willingly, and he died the next year. Uh, you're right, Adenauer did serve uh, well into his 80s, but not very successfully. Uh, he had a difficult final couple of years. And the same with Churchill. Uh, Churchill uh, went and uh, he was, I believe, James, 80 when he, he left his second term as prime minister, was unpopular, had a very difficult second term. Uh, and I think he actually had a stroke during that second term. So I think your examples illustrate why there's at least concern about it. Uh, and as I say, I would have no trouble at all. I mean, no trouble, for God's sakes, I'd vote for Biden in a minute. You know, if I could recreate the old Chicago days, I'd vote for him twice. But um, I, I, I think that uh, it has no... There is there is cause for to worry uh, about his age, James. Yeah, yeah, I, I think you're, yeah, you're well prepared. Uh, the historical knowledge paid off. But it, 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 there's a difference between I'm I'm going to be 79 in October. I don't have you know. I, I think 79 is a different age than 86. I really do, and I. I it's not going away. All right, we can do whatever we want, but it, it, it's not something that you can talk around. It, his, right. you know, it's it's omnipresent and it's never going away. And every, you know, every time that he trips or he forgets his grandchildren's names or anything like that, it's it's, it's not just going to be on Fox. It's in the New York Times. It's it's it, every focus group that someone does. It comes up and it comes up constantly and 
repeatedly. It, 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 I, I, I agree. I'm all for respecting old people being it. I'm one myself. And in Louisiana, we, we, we particularly revere elderly people. That's one of the reasons I moved back home. In, in Washington, you shit. You, you, you retired. You, you're done. I don't care what you were. You can be fucking Secretary of State. They don't give a shit. They'll run right over you. And it's not much of a reverence of, of elderly people in places like that, but yeah, I, I, I think respect for the elderly is, is a good thing, but it's, I think there's a lot of generational impatience in this country. You know, I, I talked to several people after the New York Times, Peter Baker's superb piece on the age issue in Reagan, in which it was incredibly balanced. He talked about how strong Reagan could be and that, you know, growing nine hour trip to uh, uh, over in Ukraine about how he rose to the occasion during the debt negotiations say, the union, and also that he had these lapses where he couldn't remember the names of his grandchildren and others. And everybody that called me, James, and I think probably to a person, they vote for Biden, they mentioned the lapses. I mean, that's what stuck with them. And I, you know, I'm afraid that's what resonates. And uh, so I think it's a real issue. Uh, I, hope, I hope somehow uh, he, you know, it doesn't become lethal, but I can't I, I worry that it's not going to get better. It, 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 it's, not, it's not going to get better. And, it's you know, it, it, he might, you know, if it's Trump, okay, or, you know, if it's so damaged, it, but that's the best we can hope for right now. No, n- no question. James, Rob, now we're going to come back to the states now. Rob in Millersville, Maryland says the corruption exhibited by members of the Supreme Court is beyond any comparison. He said, I've been a federal employee for over 32 years. If I did any of the things that Clarence Thomas and others did, I would have lost my job and faced potential prosecution. So what can we as citizens do to force accountability on the court? And do you think there's potential tax issues related to financial gifts, uh, like using someone's plane uh, and ship uh, a cruise ship the way Clarence Thomas did? Well, first of all, before we, well, I want to shock everybody. Of course, Brett Kavanaugh lied through his teeth repeatedly in his confirmation hearings. But who cares if a Supreme Court justice commits perjury? I mean, my God! But you know how nitpicking you want to be here, James. Um, I, I mean, Clarence Thomas is uh, is a big fat joke, all right? And and so Gorsuch selling his house and not reporting it to somebody. To, Big time lawyer, but Jane Roberts, I mean, please give me a break. Because she wears nice pearls and navy blue dresses, $10 million shakedown, headhunter for law firms, sits on a senior person in some fanatically anti anti choice group. You know, I guess she's, she's like Jenny Thomas, you know, that she doesn't discuss anything with her husband. Of course not. Who would think that? It, it's, of course not. It, it's, it's, it's worse. You know, but, but, but what's really depressing is the more you know, the worse it is. It, 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 who would, how could anybody possibly have any respect for this institution now? I just don't want to say. And truth of the matter is, very few people do. And but John Roberts is going to go down is one of the worst chief justices in history. And, and everybody, you know, oh, chief, he's, yeah, I might be a little conservative, but he's institutionalist and shit. You kidding me? Well, you certainly can make an issue of it. Uh, Terry in Oklahoma City says, now that the debt limit has been done and passed the House, it is worth noting that it is much better than most people ex- uh, expected. Particularly, it's much better than one would guess from the moaning and groaning that you and James were doing. My question for you is, are you ready to eat crow and you prefer it baked, roasted or fried? I think I'll probably take mine baked, um, uh, Terry. Uh, and I will agree. I, I, it, was, it was a much better resolution than I had expected. I mean, I still think what the Republicans did was beyond reckless. They ought to get rid of the debt limit, as Jamie Dimon said this week. It's anachronism and it's dangerous. Uh, but I must say that I, I give great credit to Shalanda Young and to, and to uh, Steve Reschetti and to the Republican negotiators that they ended up with a final package that, uh, as I say, was much better. And I'm not sure I'm going to have crow. I hope, Terry, you'll let me maybe uh, change to a little bit, maybe roasted duck. What do you think, James? 
Can, 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 I, can I get by with some old crow? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I definitely, I, I, I definitely, crow, but this is, a, 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 as a rabbi I would say, a teaching moment. So, and this is where Biden's wisdom comes in. He said, look, if I would have been out there, you don't understand. He's a legislative mechanic. And he said, if I'd have been out there bragging, I could have never gotten this. I had to stay in the background. It, it, he knew that they were, by the way, as I point out before, Slander Young is from East Baton Rouge, as is Garrett Gray, the two lead negotiators. But the things that made the negotiation successful is the reason, the same reason that he doesn't get very much credit for the things that he's done. He, he's not a great communicator, but 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 I, I, I stand corrected. I stand humble. This thing turned out much better than we thought, and we wanted him to sell it more. And the reason he gives why he didn't is a very legitimate reason. Uh, you know, he had more his signature all over it because Garrett and McCarthy and those needed a lot of Republican votes to get this passed. So it, it, it was a good civics lesson, and it was a good civics lesson for James Carville and Al Hunt. Okay, Terry, I'm going to have some roasted duck while James drinks Old Crow, uh, and, we'll, and we'll raise a glass uh, to you. Yeah, we, uh, James, we have no denying that. <laughs> Our final question is from Kristen in Ashburn, Virginia. Uh, and I'm going to actually, I'm going to put it together with another question. She said she, she ha- hasn't been following Kamala Harris closely since she became vice president. But I keep hearing on your podcast and other places that she's not really measuring up. Why is she not? I had high hopes for her. And uh, let's combine that with John, who's one of our favorites in Sonoma, California, who raises the prospect of replacing her with Shalonda Young, the powerful black OMB director who was such a key part of that budget deal. Uh, you know, first of all, I, I, I don't know, you say disappointment, I, I don't know people had uh, I don't know what the expectations are. It's a hard job. You, 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 you you know, I don't think Biden gives them, you know, the stuff she's gotten to do, pretty unglamorous stuff. I think that her biggest mistake was not getting in front of this crime issue and getting in front of it early. And that would have given her some different kind of a portfolio. But she strikes, I can't remember, she doesn't say anything very memorable. And she does exactly what you would kind of expect her to do. I mean, they tried, they gave the commissioner speech at West Point. She just doesn't break through. I I don't know if anybody else could, but she doesn't. I agree, James. Okay, keep those, keep those letters coming in. We love them. Hey, thanks for listening to Politics War Room with James Carville, and I'm Al Hunt. Don't forget to send your questions for us by email to politicswarroom at gmail.com or tweet them for next week's show at Politicon. Following this episode, we'd really appreciate it if you check out the link to our sponsor, Real Paper, in the show notes. We deeply thank you for supporting them because when you do, it helps make this podcast happen. To keep up with us, subscribe to Politics War Room on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. Please rate the show with a five-star review. We'll be back next week with another show as we continue our war room planning.